Good morning. Uh, request you all to just remain seated. We are beginning in the next probably 30 seconds to one minute. <clears throat> this should be another exciting session after a very inspiring and visionary talk by our Minister Gadkari, who set the tone on what would go a long way in helping to build a new India. Uh, I'll be requesting uh, our panelists for the next session who are uh, well-known industry leaders. Uh, this would be uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, Vice President Fiki and Joint Managing Director of Polo Hospitals Group. Mr. Selesh Patak, CEO of LNT Infrastructure Development Projects. And Mr. Sunil Vadwa, Managing Director of G Transmission uh, uh, and Distribution Division. Uh, this session will be moderated by uh, Fiki's uh, advisor, economic advisor, Mr. Ajay Chibber. And uh, the session is largely to discuss how these very, very diverse sectors, uh, which, which you all might be feeling has no synergy, but they are actually diverse and very important sectors in helping us to build a new India. So as you can see, healthcare, infrastructure, transmission and distribution. May I now request uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, Mr. Selesh Patak, Mr. Sunil Vadwa, and uh, Dr. Ajay Chibber to kindly take their seats on the dais, please. Uh, Mr. Chibber will be taking us through this uh, session uh, of discussion with the, uh, with the business leaders from three different sectors. Uh, just, just as an introduction, uh, he's a PhD from Stanford University, a master's from Delhi School of Economics, and advanced management degrees from Harvard and uh, INSEAD. Uh, he's been almost for 25 years, he's been uh, with the World Bank, and now, of course, it's a privilege and honor for us to have him as our economic advisor in FICI. I leave the floor to Mr. Chibber to take it on from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sumani. Just uh, welcome all to, I think this will be a very exciting session. I'm not sure why I've been asked to chair it, but I'm very happy to be here to do that. We have uh, three very distinguished uh, CEOs here with us. The, uh, yesterday we had the launch of the FICI AGM report uh, by the finance minister, uh, this report, which looks at, you know, India's uh, over the next 10 to 15 years. And um, one of the quotes in the book is by a legendary CEO, been associated with Fiki for a long time, the legendary J.R.D. Tata, who said, surprising for me, he said, I don't want India to be an economic superpower. I want India to be a happy country. 
And I think our objective, of course, is to perhaps do both, be an economic superpower. You saw the compounding that uh, uh, Mr. Rashid Shah showed yesterday to become the economic superpower, but also I think the shared prosperity that we talk about, the title of this AGM publication is Innovative India with Shared Prosperity. Sajja Samriddhi Ke Saath Abhinav Bharat. That is the title of the AGM publication. So I think we can do both. Why do we have to choose between happiness and prosperity? And today we have a very distinguished panel that will touch on different aspects of this issue uh, to become uh, prosperous with shared prosperity, we need to be more competitive, which is the theme of that publication, and the theme of AGM as well. And we need to create many more jobs. To create many more jobs, we will need to be far more competitive in the future. And today we have uh, this very lovely panel of three very innovative people who will talk to us in their areas. We have, uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Vadwa, who is the CEO of, um, sorry, I should have got my notes organized a little better. The managing director of GTND &G India Limited. And he has uh, a lot of experience, of course, 25 experiences with the Tata Group in the oil, gas, chemical, and fertilizer and power business. So he's going to talk to us about the energy sector, which is going to be a, a, you know, an important driver, as it were. The, the boiler room for this prosperity will have to come from the energy sector. But of course, if India grows at 9% and we start using energy at 14, 15%, we are going to have a huge impact on not just on the global environment, but also on our own environment. So he'll also, I'm sure, share with us how we can get more competitive in the energy sector then, uh, and also face some of the challenges that we face in the energy sector. Like, you know, I've been, I'm not an energy expert, but I've been at the World Bank for a very long time and given advice in many countries. And what I recall is in the energy sector, you start reforming at the DISCOM level first, and then work your way up back to transmission and generation. But I think in India, we got it the other way around to some extent, and we face the problem at the DISCOM level where the connect takes place between the energy producer and the final consumer. So I'm sure he'll share with us some of those challenges that he has faced and dealt with in a very practical way. So the floor is yours. Uh, Please. Thank you. Morning. <clears throat> I was just thinking of how to, I mean, the whole sector issues, is, everybody knows about it. So I don't know what I'm going to additionally say, but I would only say that my first job as a, in oil and gas was because it was my first job. So I just jumped into it. But when I moved on to uh, energy or the uh, electricity part of energy, 15 years later, I did some due diligence on why should I work for the, the power sector. And I think that is what really is the business case today of looking at how energy is going to be impacting the uh, uh, nation building process and the numbers we saw yesterday about all the indices that we are looking at to 2025 will need energy. So I'll just dwell on my thoughts on the relevance of energy in the economic development uh, in any country, which is a no-brainer. <clears throat> Inadequate excess of power is really a biggest challenge today on, in economic development, especially in India and all developing countries. Now, why is it so? so I sort of looked at uh, uh, what others have to say, and I found a very interesting way to convince myself that that is really the case. We'll talk about... Uh, 
investment multipliers, <coughs> I talk about economic multiplier. So if I look at energy as the, as the enabler for development, there are two ways to look at it. One is the, I mean, is the linkages to the, to the economic development, the GDP. The forward linkage and the backward linkage. So I'm coming to some specific examples through this. The backward linkage are basically if, I, if we have to produce power, we need more machinery, we need more uh, electrical equipment, we need construction equipment, we need, uh, there'll be employment. So there's going to be that much GDP created one time. So if I have a power plant of a, of a billion dollars, the billion dollar GDP gets created immediately. So that's the backward linkage of uh, having more and more power supply. But when it goes to the forward linkage, it is huge. You look at what electricity can do in terms of additional production. Uh, the products get sold, there will be employment generation again. So this process really builds the GDP through the uh, uh, additional supply of power. Now one of the things which is very, very critical in the forward linkage is an example I would like to share with you. As a, as a CSR project, we did one microgrid uh, project for one of the community around our, one of our factories in Allahabad. And not knowing really how to capture the outcomes, we just went for it because it was really no brainer. It will benefit the society. After a year or so, we wanted to scale up uh, in the entire country. We have acquired a large footprint of uh, manufacturing facilities in India. And we said, let us see what the outcome has been. And there were so interesting elements of outcome. And we had one consultant who helped us. We looked at the number of hours the kerosene was being used, the liters of kerosene being used by that small village which had 100 people, the number of hours the shops were remaining open in the evenings because of the microgrid having come in, the additional employment generation and the income generation because of that, the, le the reduction in the crime rate, the thefts, reduction in the insect bites, reduction in the dog bites, okay? Uh, number of people who were reading newspapers, number of people who started seeing television, additional mobile phones which came into that, the awareness that people had in, in terms of what is available in the market, their urge to earn more money to buy those products. I mean, this is huge forward linkage by just having a small microgrid. If you multiply this by a million times, I don't know what percentage of GDP growth can be, but just by supplying electricity and the multiplier effect of that. Now, also the agri-produce increase because of availability of water and, and pumping storage and systems like that. Now, I come to the India challenges. So there is no brainer that you know, energy access is really important for the, for the GDP growth and all the indices that we were targeting, which are realistic. But the biggest challenge that we are going to face, which also we are facing today, is that once these uh, unconnected consumers who are now getting connected, there are about 25 million consumers who have been connected in the last 13 months, uh, the strengthening of the last mile connectivity, we are going to see a surge of demand coming from that suppressed demand area. I remember an example when I used to be the, uh, uh, heading the Delhi Discom of Tata Power. We, were, we used to compute the, we used to forecast the demand for the next year. There was one year when the TND losses came down. Tariff also incidentally had to go up in that year. And we projected the demand to come down. Surprisingly, the, the demand increase in that year from Delhi was three times the national average. And only one thing we had missed out in, in forecasting was the fact that all our last mile connectivity had been restored and there were no, uh, shall I say, overloaded transformers, there were no connections who were facing problems because of uh, uh, the supply not being available. We were surprised. We said, law of economics, which says that elasticity of demand, price, uh, demand is price elastic, failed here. Everybody had to pay for every unit they are, produce, uh, they are consuming. They had to pay higher price, but the demand went up. So I see the demand in India because of this last mile connectivity going at least 100% higher in the next 10 years. Discom's health is a big problem today. I think the government is taking the right steps in terms of segregating the demand, uh, sorry, the, the content and carriage component, because the real problem the discounts face today is in the revenue gap, which is left in the power purchase cost and the cost that they are able to recover. So I think these are some of the things which the, which the discounts uh, have to really reform. 
and I will not take much time now. Maybe during the interaction we can talk about the challenges which India faces, which the government has to really speed up the reforms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunil ji. That's wonderful. And uh, I think we'll have many more opportunities to get into some of these as the question uh, comes. Part of the quadril, what I call the competitiveness quadrilateral of shared prosperity is, of course, energy and infrastructure. And part of it is, of course, the most important part is human capital. And there, of course, we have education and we, uh, we have uh, underinvested in education. But more importantly, we have underinvested hugely in health. Uh, we uh, spend, public spend on health is about 1.3% 1, 1 of GDP. Yesterday or day before yesterday, I think the Prime Minister announced that he would like to see India's public spend on health go up to 2.6% of GDP by 2025. In this report, we recommend actually going even further to about 3% of GDP. So that's one issue that I think the health sector faces, but there are many other issues as well, including the fact that because the public sector was not spending enough, the private sector, of course, has moved in. And this mixed model that we have now uh, is addressing some of the needs of people. But we also point out in our report that the out-of-pocket expenses of people are some of the highest in the world relative to per capita income. And then uh, is introduced this very big and bold and innovative scheme called Ayushman Bharat. So to address all these, we have, of course, somebody who needs no introduction to all of you. Sangeeta ji is here. And I have uh, one, of course, direct question to her, which is that in the business digest that you all have, she is quoted as saying, India can provide health care at one-tenth of the cost compared to the rest of the world. And so I'd like to pose that, of course, as a question to her. Can we do it? How can we do it? And also, are we going in the right direction in some of these initiatives? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Namaste. So for the last 35 years of my life, I've done almost nothing but healthcare. And so every aspect of making people healthier, finding ways to prevent them from getting sick, and the infrastructure and the scenario around care is something that fascinates me, amazes me, and very, very often makes me extremely sad. It is, um, you know, as Mr. Ajay rightly said, a sector that's, uh, that needs a lot of transformation. And currently, I don't know how many, I mean, it's a room full of industrialists and businessmen and businesswomen, but healthcare is actually the world's largest, and I won't say industry, but the world's largest sector. If you combine the public and private spend globally, it's larger than automobiles, it's larger than energy. And of course, I believe it's most impactful. If you look at global thinking, and Ratan Tata was appropriately quoted to say, let my country not be rich, but be happy. I think health and the social development index is one of the most important aspects of it. So I'm going to you know, quickly, quickly give this overview snapshot so that subsequently we can talk more about it. So the size of the sector in India is about 372 billion, estimated to reach that number by 2022. The growth rate is about 16%. The fact that was alluded to about the role of the private sector is actually that private spec sector is undertaking 80% of advanced care and almost 60% of secondary and primary health care, which is truly significant. The Ayushman Bharat, which was again alluded to, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful, most ambitious scheme, but the fact is it heralds the new era where the government is unabashedly moving into the payer aspect that we will provision for care without directly delivering the service. And this is a significant move, which is going hand in hand with the fact 
that private sector is primarily the driver of healthcare delivery in this country. Talking about the healthcare spend, the number of 1.2 or 1.3 percent, but the fact is that we are actually already spending 5 percent of GDP. But we're spending 5 percent of GDP because this spend comes out of pocket. And when I said to you earlier that many things about healthcare pains me, one of the biggest fact is that for somebody to afford to have a bypass surgery, they very often sell their land or pawn their wife's jewelry to afford to get one of their family members that surgery. And so this system of direct provisioning of care, and incidentally, health is the second largest reason for rural indebtedness. We talk about farmer suicide because of agrarian distress. However, health is significantly one of the reasons that people are pushed into poverty. And I think the, the figure is actually that 16 people per hour are pushed into indebtedness because of health reasons. So this whole move of covering health through a third party, I think very famously about um, you know, four prime ministers ago, my father was speaking at the podium, and he said to the, uh, you know, the prime minister then, and this was almost 17 years ago, and he said, if I, after this speech, fell down and had to repair you know, anything that happened to me, two fractures, etc., nowhere else in the world but in India would we have to pay for it out of pocket. The third-party payer system which is today in place, and I'm sure all of you are covered by health insurance, is the only way that people can afford health care. Because the cost of technology, input, infrastructure has increasingly grown to the fact that you cannot afford, expect a teacher, a driver, and even most individuals, if you need advanced cancer care, uh, to pay out of pocket. So let me ask all of you, how many of you don't have health insurance? Is there anyone in this audience who doesn't have health insurance? Two people, three people, three out of this whole room. So while I would advise you to get insurance unless you are precluded from it, I would just say that this is a reflection of the work that has happened in this sector. 35 years ago, anyone who needed good care would travel abroad. Today, you don't need to. 16 years ago, most people paid out of pocket. Today, most of the country uh, who can afford it are covered, and today with Ayushman Bharat, Arugya Shri, which was actually the, the seminal program in Andhra Pradesh, which heralded universal health coverage. They covered eight crore people in a period of seven months. Uh, we were party to, to designing that scheme. So universal health insurance, uh, coverage of the entire country, are two important aspects in the triangular requirements of healthcare, which is access, both geographic and financial, Quality, which is a huge subject which we don't have time to talk about, but I know that Fiki is doing some really good work on it. And finally, and most importantly, is the entire aspect of the, the cost of care. And again, Ajay spoke about it, so I just want to say in one very single sentence, this is not an aspiration that India will deliver care at one-tenth of the price. This is a current reality. Um, I think... Uh, Many of you who are, and I know that um, uh, Mr. Kurakiwala is here in the audience and Pankaj Bhai just stepped out, but we know that if you compare the cost of a bypass surgery in the US or a cost of a bypass surgery in India today, it is one-tenth. And the same goes to cataract, to dental treatment, to a range of things. So not only can India provide or provision for care for our country, but today medical value travel is about a $3 billion sector growing at over 27 to 30 percent per year because we are attracting people for high quality and low cost. But this is the existing sector. We still have a shortage of beds. We need to treble our number of beds, but more significantly, we have to double our doctors, grow by four times our nurses, and almost by nine times our paramedics. So there's a huge manpower shortage. In a sector which generates the maximum number of employment per rupee spent is healthcare. But I want to use my last two minutes to give you a little bit of a vision of the future of healthcare. Because I believe the future of healthcare may use the infrastructure we're building today, but will be completely driven 
by the sciences and the technology which is available and which is evolving. So healthcare of the future will be defined by three Bs. The first B is biology. The day your genome was deciphered was the day that people began to understand why the guy who can eat three masala dosas doesn't get a heart attack and the one who's on a diet is, is getting, getting that heart attack. Why your friend who had uh, cancer but has never smoked in his life is being visited in his room by someone who still smokes two packs a day. This is genetics. So biology and our ability to decipher the gene, change that gene with manipulation, and choose and select healthy genes is going to be the healthcare in the next five to 10 years. The second important B is actually bytes. Our processing capacity for data. What we saw is a single image of a CT scan Today, when they move from 68 slice to 128 slice to 360, and now we're merging images and modalities. The PET CT takes the radioactive update and merges that with the radio, uh, radiology imaging, telling you where a cancer hotspot is. This processing and computing capacity is now moving into artificial intelligence. So if we take the data that we will collect through Ayushman Bharat, we've, we've done it with our data at Apollo, we're now doing cardiac risk scoring in a global data consortium with Microsoft. So we will be able to predict and stratify societies to high propensity populations and therefore treat those who are at risk. Because today in India, when someone has a cardiac problem, we never open one vessel or do a single vessel angioplasty. You're opening three and four and five. In the US, 47% of angioplasties are single vessel. In the US, 71% of women finding cancer or breast cancer find it in stage one. In India, it's almost 80% of patients finding their cancer in stage three and stage four. So this processing, computing, and genetic analysis is going to find a way for us to find disease early. So hopefully you won't need to go to the hospital most of the time. You will be treated in a clinic. You will be treated at home. You will be treated by input from your mobile phone. That is the future of healthcare. That's where we're moving. And so the third B, after the biology, after the processing of bites, is bandwidth. That connectivity will bring advanced healthcare to your hand, in your pocket, in your purse, at the touch of a phone. You can talk to a doctor, you can maintain your records, you can predict what you want to prevent, you can test your blood glucose, you can make sure you get your drug and dose diagnostic delivered at home. The whole world of care is changing. And while it's changing, I want it to change significantly in only one way. We may add science, we may add money, we may add capability, we may add networks. But the one thing which has to remain is that care must remain at the center of healthcare. And that personal touch, that empathy, that humanity, I think is something that we can do very well in India. So not only do I project and predict that India will care at one tenth of global prices, but I also project and predict that India can become the epicenter of healthcare with a culture of caring and human touch, with an integration of alternate medicine, with an overlay of technology, and with a vision to find a way to be proactive about healthcare. So I thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Sangeeta Ji. That's brilliant. Um, you know, health is, is so complex, so important. Health outcomes depend on health, of course, as you pointed out, but on so many other factors air pollution, education, roads, connectivity, and you brought it together very nicely. I bet you the health insurance premiums for Delhi residents will increase because at some point the insurance companies will realize that you're all smoking two packets of cigarettes a day just by living in Delhi. Uh, but I don't know if that's going to happen, but I hope it doesn't. But let's uh, shift uh, to another very important aspect aspect of uh, co competitiveness, uh, drive, and of course we just heard um, Minister Gutkari lay out for us how much progress has been made in the infrastructure sector, and yet of course business people know that it still remains a very important part of, part of the cost driver for many of their businesses and, and 
And today we have a very um, dynamic CEO, Mr. Shailesh Patak, who is the Chief Executive Officer of LNT Infrastructure, to talk about this. And uh, take on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I see a lot of younger people in the audience who are usually smarter than me. So I'll start uh, with uh, uh, a request to them. Exactly 10 years later, and all of you will be around to see the day, India will become the third largest economy in the world. Exactly 10 years later. I'm on Twitter, SHYPK. There is a pinned tweet which gives the exact time. Next year, we will overtake the United Kingdom. In 2019, India's economy will become bigger than the United Kingdom. In about four years, we'll be bigger than Germany. So we'll be the fourth largest economy in the world. And in 2018, we will overtake Japan. And the only two economies bigger than India will be the US and China. So that's the good news. What's the bad news? The bad news is that the only thing holding back India is actually Indians and our systems. And I'm talking about infrastructure here. Um, most critical infrastructure, according to me, for India to progress is education. And that to primary and school, secondary, high school education. And we are making a mess of it. But this is not the time to talk about that. Health, we talked about. Power, we talked about. I'll stick to infrastructure. So about uh, 18 years ago, Mr. Nitin Gadkari was giving some advice on infrastructure to us. And I still remember what he told me. He said, if there is a will, there is a way. If there is no will, there is survey. And for a long time, instead of action and getting things done, we have been talking about survey. And there is a specific syndrome which afflicts some of us called the MAFA syndrome. The MAFA syndrome, M-A-F-A, -A, is essentially mistaking articulation for action. Just because someone is saying something doesn't mean that something gets done. And here is my tribute to Mr. Gadkari. He's actually gotten things done. So let me uh, begin by talking uh, very briefly about uh, our company, Larson & Tubro. Some of you may have heard about it. We uh, did 120,000 crores of turnover last year. And uh, we are very well known for uh, our construction business. But there's a whole lot beside uh, Sardar Patel statue in Mumbai, the Mumbai Trans Harbour Link, the bridge across the sea has started. The Mumbai Metro is being made uh, by us. The coastal road in Mumbai is be being made by us. In Delhi, the Dwarka Convention Center, the Dwarka Expressway, currently underway. In Hyderabad, we have commissioned one of the finest metro systems in India. It's carrying 160,000 passengers every day, the second largest metro network in the country. And just to talk about other places in other states, we have uh, huge irrigation projects in Madhya Pradesh, in Patna and in Varanasi. We are doing water and sewerage projects so that open drains will be a thing of the past in the next five years. So that's l &T construction. But of course, uh, there is, uh, uh, we have a power plant generating power. We have a large defense business just supplied 100 very large guns to the army. We have a large IT and tech services business and of course, smart world and communications. My particular company is in the PPP space. So we take up PPP projects. We bid for them, win, finance, construct, and operate. Currently, we have uh, about 16 operational assets, which is also one of the reasons why Canada's largest pension fund, CPPIB, has invested 2,000 crores in our company four years ago. So uh, the success story. The success story is that uh, in the last one year, as I was talk talking to Dr. Rajay, in the last one year, we have many highways that collect toll on a daily basis. And the success story is that in the last one year, 
electronic toll collection has gone up by 77%, whereas overall toll collection has gone up by about 11%. And if any of you have problems getting through a toll plaza, anyone has problems getting through toll plazas? Yes? Please go and install something called a fast tag, an electronic sticker on your windshield. I'm willing to bet half your problems will be over. Let's just go back to something that uh, uh, Mr. Gadkari said. He said that we are uh, commissioning express highways, access controlled express highways in India. Just as context, the United States passed the Federal Highways Grant Act in 1956, and most of the interstates in the US were actually constructed between 1956 and 1965. So this is not new technology, this is not you know, very complex. But we had too many surveys. Now we are getting there. But the problem is that anyone in Delhi, anyone in Delhi lost five years of your life. I'm repeating this. Anyone staying in Delhi lost five years of your life because of the delay in the construction of the two ring roads in Delhi. What are these ring roads? Kundli Manesar Palwal on the western side and Kundli Ghaziabad uh, Palwal on the eastern side. One was done by the Haryana State Industrial Development Corporation and the other one was done by NHAI. And mind you, these were monitored by the Supreme Court right from 2006. So what happened? I'll tell you a little story. 30 seconds. HSIDC bid out the Kundli Manesar Palwal Expressway in 2005 awarded it in 2006 to a company that ran out of money in 2007. All the infrastructure experts here know about this. And there was no way that expressway was going to be built by that company. It took nine years to get rid of that contract and give it out on a construction contract to another company. Nine years, ladies and gentlemen. You lost five years of your life. On the other side, NHAI was trying to bid out the Eastern Peripheral Expressway, which has just been con uh, completed earlier this year. They, they bid it out twice, both times on public-private partnership, both times cancelled the bids, and finally, the EPC contract was awarded two years ago. It got done in two years. So I just want to leave you with one thing. Construction of a highway does not take more than 910 days. We know. We have constructed over 30 highways. In fact, one of our highways in Odessa was commissioned in March this year. Another one in Telangana in October last year. It does not take more than 910 days. Uh, 135 kilometers. Right? Actually, the Odessa one is 150. But the point is, we waste too much time in contracting. So if we are going to be the 10th largest economy in, in 10 years, or third largest economy in 10 years, we have to fix this problem. Why should we take nine years to put out a contract which will get three years to construct? And that is where I just wanted to suggest that while Mr. Gadkari kept talking about investment, what is much more relevant for us in India is construction. Construction is the second largest job created in India. And the only thing holding back construction is ourselves and our contracts. So five years of your life have been lost because of these two expressways not getting built in time. Can we figure out a way to get such contracts done in exactly one to two years, which is how it is the rest of the world, so that construction can happen quicker? An outstanding example of this, and some of you may be aware, is the largest anti-poverty program in India since independence. It is called the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, the Prime Minister's Rural Roads Program. Runaway success, no investment by the private sector, and what excellent execution and quality. Today, less than 5% of India's road, uh, uh, villages are not connected by all-weather roads. So we have examples of excellent construction 
excellent contract management in the PMJSY and others. And particularly, most of India does not happen in, in, in Delhi, right? It's not just the government of India, it's 29 states and seven union territories. How can we transfer the lessons learned from successes in the union government to make sure that state governments succeed? And we can talk about that in the question answer session. The other thing that is very closely linked to all of us and to state governments is cities. Almost all of you live in cities. And today the fundamental economic problem of India is agriculture is not remunerative. So how do you get the excess manpower and woman power in agriculture into city-based jobs? And the biggest constraint there is that our cities are very, 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 very badly governed. Those of you who have gone to, to cities outside India would wonder why they are managing their cities much better than ours. Almost everyone I know has some cousin in the United States and they talk about American cities, but Indian cities are not at the same level. Why? And this is another problem that the young people in this audience need to think about. And, and it, you know, infrastructure is largely urban infrastructure. If you discount roads, transmission lines, and gas pipelines, almost every infrastructure is city-based. Think about it. An airport is an urban infrastructure. A railway station is urban infrastructure. So let's talk about railway stations. We had a great chance of upgrading Indian railway stations, right? And you know that the railway station carries far more people than the, and an airport. Why didn't we succeed? The cities that all of you have grown up in have changed beyond recognition in the last 15 years. The one thing in that city that has not changed is the railway station. Am I right? So when do we get tracking on our railway stations? And I go to Japan and I see Kyoto Railway Station, which is best, better than most airports in India. And I just wonder when we will start thinking about urban infrastructure. So I just want to leave you with four broad takeaways for what we need to do in the next 10 years so that we hit that number three slot after US and China. Number one. No surveys. Where there is a will, there is a way. Let us be agnostic about, you know, we waste too much time talking about PPP is being better than this and, you know, it doesn't matter about the, the color of the, the cat. As long as we get construction going, we are on our way. Otherwise, we are wasting our time. So when we talk about how to revive the PPP structure, actually, you know what? It's much better for the government to get things constructed. And once they are constructed, give it out for operations and maintenance on a public-private partnership contract. The best success that Gadkari ji talked about is the TOT, the Toll Operate and Transfer contract of NHA. Work will work every single time. So let's be agnostic. Let's not be too ideological about we will do it only this way. What works is what is good. If construction is happening, jobs are created. That is good for us. The second takeaway, and that we something that we don't talk about often enough, is contract enforcement. India, as well as South Asia, is really miserable in contract enforcement. A couple of numbers here. Three years, four years ago, our rank out of 189 countries was 186 in contract enforcement globally in the ease of doing business rankings. Which were the country, uh, countries behind us? Bangladesh, Papua New Guinea, and uh, uh, I think uh, Timor West. Now, fortunately, we are 163 out of 190 countries. It was the worst rank we had in the ease of doing business four years ago. 163 is the worst rank in all our ease of doing business rankings today. And this is not just government to business, this is business to business. You give a check to XYZ in Singapore, the check bounces, someone goes to jail. In India, the check bounces, it is the start of negotiations. So, if we are going in for a developed economy, we have to be able to enforce our contracts, government against business, business against government, business against business. And here I'll say that the only people who are making money out of the current state is our uh, friends in the legal system. Nobody else. 
you are not benefiting, we are not benefiting, my friends in the bar are benefiting. So we have to get contract enforcement going. All of South Asia has this problem, so I believe there's a problem with our legal ecosystem. The third is, you know, this oft-repeated question about financing of infrastructure. My sense is, as Mr. Gadkari said, he has no shortage of money. There is enough and more assets that the government has that can be monetized, instead of trying to go in a, in a circuitous route and say that, you know, construction will be financed by the private sector. I often use an allegory of a caterpillar that turns into a butterfly. All of you know that caterpillars turn into butterflies. Caterpillars are ugly to look at, full of risk construction, under construction projects. <laughs> butterflies are post-construction, cash flow yielding, beautiful assets. So, Delhi's T3 airport is a butterfly. Jaiwar airport is a caterpillar. Where do you think the private sector would be more interested, the butterfly or the caterpillar? Construction, of course, we'll be interested in Jaiwar, the caterpillar. Operations and cash flow, we'll be interested in T3. And that is why Canada's largest pension fund, as I said, has invested in us. Because they are looking at the next 10, 20 years of operating things like T3. So the money is there. It's just prioritizing how you get private money in and where you deploy government money out. And the last thing I'll say is how can we leverage technology? How can we digitalize our infrastructure? And here, I'd say that Larson and Tubro LNT is really leading the way in terms of digitalization. We know exactly how much operating each of our machinery across India is doing because it's all in the cloud. And I, I, I talked about electronic tolling. Today, we are on a month-on-month -month basis for our NHI projects. We are earning, let's say, 92 crores from cash and 33 crores from electronic. I want to make it five crores from cash and the rest from electronic tolling. This will happen. And how can we use such digitalization, such technology in infrastructure in India? So I'll just repeat, where there's a will, there's a way. And we will become the third largest economy in the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bajan. That was very good. And also, I mean, we were in a kind of a morass with all this infrastructure banking problem connected to it. And now it seems we are seeing our way out through this very pragmatic approach that the minister has taken and CEOs like you are taking. I want to throw it up to the audience, but let me ask quickly one question to each of the speakers with a, hopefully a one or two minute answer and then throw it up to the audience. So let me start with you, Mr. Wadwa, and ask you, you did present us a very good picture on what's happening in the energy sector, and we have so much capacity now, and yet, uh, going back to surveys, if you do a business survey, you end up with most businesses pointing to the cost of energy as a major constraint to them. So can you say something on that, perhaps? Yes, yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> this is a very special uh, uh, situation in India where being a social uh, economy, socialist economy, the tariff structure that is basically uh, existing in India, which is decided by the state government, not the state government, the state regulators who are appointed by the state government and therefore some influence definitely is there. In fact, the, the tariff orders have to be approved by the uh, chief Minister of the state with respect to whether they can give a subsidy or not. So the tariff structure if you see in India is a social tariff structure. If you apply the cost accounting principles, actually the, the bulk consumer should get the cheapest power because the cost to serve a bulk consumer is lower and they are being served at a high voltage. So the cost is even lower because of that. Distribution cost is less. World over in all developed economies, the bulk consumers, the commercial industries pay much lesser than the domestic. And the smaller the consumption, the higher is the tariff per unit. It is exactly the reverse in India. So there are some inbuilt cost subsidies. Uh, and uh, so effectively, I would say the industries are paying for two uh, elements of cost which do not, uh, should not be mapped to their consumption. One is the ATNC losses in the system 
which they have to bear because the discoms get that uh, uh, pass through of ATNC losses on a normative basis. There's about 20 percent of the tariff that industries pay takes into account the, uh, the losses, uh, which is the commercial loss. Secondly, there's a cross subsidy to subsidize the subsidizing consumer. Now, uh, we have been talking about this uh, uh, and, and there is probably a reform happening because I've seen the tariff structure, the tariff policy which is coming. So maybe there would be more of intra-category cross subsidies, which I mean is that the industry should really pay what it costs the discoms. When it comes to domestic, also from the conservation point of view, the domestic consumers, when they consume too much, they have to really cross subsidize those who are consuming less. There is no other way. And I think the cost of uh, energy on an average in India, there is about 15% of ATNC loss, which perhaps can be further factored in. And the reforms which are needed for discoms, I worked in a discom for 10 years, and, and I was very hesitant to get into that because it was taking over of a electricity board. After 10 years, I realized that that has been the most engaging assignment in my life, most engaging. And most of the employees who joined uh, from outside said, sir, whatever we've learned in our, in, our, uh, in our education has actually been put to practice. I don't think that the state government owned uh, 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 discoms where the head of the organization himself is not sure how many years he's going to stay. He's going to take long-term decisions on load growth, reliability. So I think there is a need to look at reforming the discom uh, discoms and I don't think I have time here to give my suggestions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sangeeta ji, you have such a broad perspective, so perhaps I could ask you this question. You know, there's a quote from Mahatma Gandhi pre-independence, I mean, probably in the 30s, when he said, sanitation is more important than independence even. And yet it took us 70 years to focus on sanitation, which we now realize has such a huge impact on health and health outcomes. And of course, now things are happening. So perhaps a question for you. How, why, how, why did it take us so long and how do you see now things developing? I think clearly I'm not um, equipped to answer why it took so long. Okay. Neither was I in the government nor in the policy making on that one. But I think the fact that it's well understood that the quality of water and sanitation are two of the most significant social determinants of healthcare. And as we focus on prevention, whether it's Swachh Bharat or the awareness levels, the combination of those are, are making a significant difference. I would in the same breath like to add the important factor of nutrition. Because it is a reality that approximately 27% of our children are undernourished or malnourished. And there's a large segment where we have a carbohydrate adequacy, however, a micronutrient inadequacy. So the need to adjust nutrition across the country because the long-term implications on reduced brain and mental development, on hearing and problems, various neurological uh, impact is not been well understood, appropriately documented, surveyed or researched, but I think significantly can be easily corrected and therefore we should move into that aspect quickly. So I would say it's sanitation, it's water and nutrition all three social determinants of health uh, need a lot more focus. And I, I think it's getting there. I also want to add one other important and interesting sidebar is that the current primary health care centers in the country, over 500,000 of them, there is a pilot project going on to convert primary health care centers into health and wellness centers. If that happens appropriately, the impact and the burden of disease could reduce because of a proactive uh, approach to healthcare. And I think this was one of Fiki's recommendations to the government for the last 10 years that we've been on the health committee and you know, Shobha sitting here. So we're all happy to see some of those changes and some of those things happening. Thank you so much. You're absolutely right. Um, so um, I was so happy to hear in your talk, uh, Shailesh, that the Canadian Pension Fund is putting money into infrastructure in India. I think all of us were happy to hear that. <laughs> because my impression was that part of the reason we got into a banking problem was because we couldn't attract this kind of outside money. 
So how do you see this? Is it because now that these, uh, how did this happen and, and is this uh, sort of a promise of things to come that we will expect to see more of this? Because things have started moving on, uh, as you said, uh, rather than surveys we are getting. And, and yet, of course, there are still huge cost overruns. There are still time overruns on many projects. So anything perspective on this financing issue? Right. Um, two parts. One is the cost overruns and time overruns. I'll address that uh, up front. And then I'll talk about uh, how pension funds are getting interested in India. A large part of the time overruns and cost overruns are because of A, poor contract enforcement, and B, because of our tendency to tender in haste and repent at leisure. This is actually a, a, a variation on the old cliche of marry in haste and repent in leisure. Yes. So this is tender in haste and repent in leisure. Uh, typically, and again, l &T operates in 30 countries uh, across the world. In most of those countries, the project specifications are discussed threadbare and finalized even before any construction starts. However, in India, there is this lovely affinity for something called change of scope. And half the construction companies actually make their money from change of scope. So, uh, we need to get our tendering right. We need to get our project specifications right. After that, the process of converting steel, cement, and, and concrete into a finished product is not so difficult. So, so that's the first. On the financing issue, you know, uh, as I said, there are people who will invest in butterflies. And very, very few private, pure private people will invest in caterpillars, which is under construction projects. Construction companies would love more construction contracts, but pension funds would probably not like the risk that surrounds most Indian construction contracts. So just to give you an example, I'm sure all the people in this room have some sort of pension. Let me take a vote of hand, Sajay. Uh, I give you the option of investing your pension savings in the T3 airport in Delhi, which is safe for the next 30 years, or investing in the Jaiwar airport that's going to come up in Noida. How many people would invest in the T3 airport? Show of hands, please. Okay. How many people would invest in the Jaiwar upcoming airport? Very clearly, no, we want both. But you know, it's like giving non-vegetarian food to a vegetarian person doesn't work. <laughs> Both want food. But pension funds do not want caterpillars. So essentially what's happened is the Canadians actually have been visiting India and I've been interacting with them since 2005. It's only now that they are working up the, the comfort to invest in completed assets. So just to give you a specific example, it's not what I say, it's what I do. In May 2018, we took five of our highways and put it in a trust called an in Infrastructure Investment Trust, INVIT. 3,700 crores was the equity that we raised in INVIT. 55% came from outside India. In fact, Allianz Capital Partners of Germany invested 25%, their first investment in Asia. And right now, we are under negotiations with another Canadian pension fund that wants to buy the rest. So, you know, horses for courses, do not try to give uh, non-veg food to veg people, that's all. <laughs> Sunil ji on this. No, no, I just wanted to add that uh, <coughs> there are investors for both phases. Some would take construction risk yeah. and some would only enter when the uh, construction is over at a different valuation. So there is definitely, and I raised hands uh, for both of us that I would get a cheaper price when it is at construction stage and I probably will have to pay a higher price when the construction is completed because the project is de-risked. And, and uh, I think that's what uh, Shailesh you would like yeah. to say. And but so here's, and, and here's, uh, here's a public policy question. See, if I am an investor and I want 25% return on my investment, then the infrastructure that is created is go going to become too expensive. Hmm. Yeah. So, and, so do you really want expensive infrastructure which benefits an investor? 
or you want infrastructure that is quickly created. Yeah, there was one other thing I wanted to say on this. Yeah. That there used to be times, uh, you know, seven, eight years back or ten years back, when exiting from a project was very difficult. Lock-in periods were very, very long. And then the problem was that if someone is wanting to take a construction risk, then he has to be locked in for five years. I think the government has reformed in the last few years of a shorter lock-in period. But there still remains a problem. I mean, in many cases, for example, solar projects, you have a lock-in of one year post-COD, which is fair, because you would anyway not get a patient uh, uh, capital investor before it is stabilized for one year. Right. But the process involved in getting approvals is so, so difficult. I mean, I think we need to you know, talk about these with the right. government. To the extent, and I was hearing from one of the large uh, uh, transmission player, that when they have a loan from one bank, and the bank is selling the loan to the next bank, downselling, every time the bank downsells, the, C, the, the regulatory commission has to approve. I don't know why the regulatory commission needs to approve, because there is an annuity fixed, the project is completed, it is between the bankers to decide uh, to take it or not. So these are unnecessary hurdles still, yeah. despite the... Uh, yeah, and of course, we only, only in India can LIC have to put a lot of money in ILF and NFS too. Anyway, I won't delve deeper into that one, but let me throw it open for a few questions. We don't have too much time. Maybe we will be able to take two or three questions. So let's see who would like, whoever would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Karnveer Mundre and I run two companies, a life sciences consulting firm called Atharva Life Sciences and a media public relations company called Atharva Mark. Well, my question is for ma ma uh, Ms. Ruddy, ma'am. Uh, you know, you talk a very positively about um, the healthcare industry. Uh, believe me, I hope you are, what you're saying is true. But in my opinion, it's in quite a bit of doldrums. We have found cures for only two or three diseases, cures in the history. Uh, you know, we have a, a, an antibiotic resistance problem which is going out of hand, which is a disaster for the country. Tuberculosis, even with all the genetic uh, mapping, there is no uh, second line, third line, uh, new uh, thing. Clinical trials, it was supposed to be the next IT, uh, you know, this yeah. poor policy, poor could thing. could ask so, the question. Yeah, so the question is that where do you think, one is, Two parts, where do you think healthcare is going in light of all this? And secondly, how do we create more trust in doctors? You know, create, I'm on some committees and we are talking about benchmarks. Like in the UK, you have uh, time related benchmarks to an ambulance reaching, time related to how the emergency should treat the right. patient and so on. Thank so, you. two parts to my question. So, it's truly a, a deep and insightful question. And, um, the, the ramifications of many of the things you've spoken about are quite significant, whether it's nosocomial infection and uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, but I think what we need to do is actually look at the larger picture and do a prioritization. This is a sector which is underdeveloped, underfunded, and underappreciated. Uh, it has inadequate legislation. And it is so diverse and dispersed that it's also difficult to handle it. So I would say that what has been happening over the last 15, 20 years is actually just improve infrastructure, try and catch up with the requirement of manpower. At the same time, the policy level requirements have not been appropriately addressed. And if we do that, which is possible to do now, uh, I think we can, whether it's in nosocomial infections, can we look at formularies, etc. So I think the time has come now to look at the next phase, but all the disease or most of the disease you mentioned are not really the significant ones in terms of the volume or the bulk of everyday problems, except tuberculosis. And in TB today, it's more a compliance issue than a medication issue. The bigger problem which has not been addressed is that we haven't spent enough on research. We are not bringing out the next level armamentarium for the country. And the bigger tragedy is that India, which was a pharmaceutical hub, has given away most of its core element manufacturing to China. And therefore, we, were mo we are moving 
into a, a dependency era in pharmaceutical, which we never should have. So the need for policy to be a little more far-thinking in terms of healthcare is absolutely correct. However, I think um, when you're on a running train, you don't have that much time to repair the tracks. Mm. So now that the running train has figured out how to get onto a faster track, the tracks behind can, we can begin to start repairing them. I think Infra is inspiring me to give those kind of examples. <laughs> but uh, but basically, uh, we had to focus on priorities, which was access. You cannot do policy and science when people are dying every day. Once those have reached some level of adequacy, this is the time to look for policy in the future. But thank you for a really thank good you. question. One more question. If yeah. uh, can I ask a question? I'm here. Yeah, okay, go ahead. You have the mic already. So, <laughs> so um, uh, I'm a, a management consultant and we help foreign companies setting up their operations in India. So my question is towards Mr. Patak. Um, you very rightly mentioned that contract enforcement is in a very bad shape. Uh, it still is really a very, very tough uh, question which we need to answer to those people who are trying to invest in India. Yeah. So, I want to know uh, what is your suggestion on how it can be improved. Yeah. So that's, I wanted to have Let's your idea. Let's take the other question also. Uh, sir, you go ahead. Yeah. Hello. My uh. question is to Madam Reddy. is not to offending the health sector, private health sector in India, but it's a general perception among the uh, public that the doctors in private hospitals, they have become more of a bhakshak than a rakshak. What is your take on this, please? Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, I didn't man. understand the words, but the tonality I understood, so I can figure <laughs> out what you mean. And uh, I think rakshak. that was really the second part, yes. Rakshak, yeah. rakshak is saver, bhakshak is a business. Okay. Grabs. Oh, who eats up, yeah. So that's what the tonality I could understand. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think that um, the terminology physician heal thyself, it's a very important uh, phrase in healthcare. I think it is significant and needs to be done. I cannot wish away the negativities which are happening in healthcare. There are things which are inappropriate, and I think they're systemic. If an individual pays 50 lakhs to a crore of rupees for a medical college seat and two crores for a postgraduate seat, all of you are businessmen, you're going to ask for return on investment. So either that student or his family is going to ask for it. So unfortunately, the scenario is pushing things into that, but it gets even worse. But I just want to tell all of you that uh, everyone is not doing that. And whether it's a combination of media or public perception, um, it is the, the healthcare sector has been painted worse than it actually is. There are a number of ethical uh, organizations and a number of very good and caring doctors. We ourselves follow the scenario that none of our doctors get any incentives for lab tests or diagnostic tests ordered because we want the only reason that somebody is prescribing is for that that the individual or the patient needs it. But again, I think technology will take us one level higher in that automated care pathways, which will be accessible to all of you, will make a more empowered and educated patient able to ask a doctor for what he's doing and therefore drive to a better healthcare system. So it's a two-way thing. We need to fix policy uh, and therefore, you know, we need to encourage ethical behavior and individual patients and consumers need to get a lot more educated uh, about the way they make their decision making. Thank you. So, the other question, uh, would you like to take? Yeah, would sure. you like to say something, Sunilji? Let's go on it. But after him. Uh, uh, I just Between wanted to say, Sunil, I read in the newspapers, I must uh, therefore believe that it is true about a year back, that the doctors in Canada were not happy with the salaries they were getting. They wanted a cut in the salaries. I don't know how many of you have read that. And uh, probably what you're saying is right, because the cost of education yes. is like cost of cost to serve. And, and uh, I think that needs to be regulated for ultimately the economics to work for the doctors to also charge uh, right. reasonable. I mean, they are charging reasonable in terms of the return, 
but the, but the cost is not appearing to be reasonable for, the ben for yeah. those who are getting the benefit. This is a very important uh, uh, element right. to check and, and, and right. to regulate. Yeah, contract enforcement. Thank you for that question. I'm happy to have a much longer discussion. But, you know, it's A, contract enforcement and dispute resolution. The lack of dispute resolution is what is killing all of us. And B, it is not only for foreign companies coming into India. It is even worse for Indian companies operating in India. When we go to a foreign country, we are much more comfortable with contract enforcement and dispute resolution. So how do you make it happen? I think broadly three ways. One, the legislature, the second, the judiciary, and third, the executive. What the legislature can do is say that we have a very, very antique contract act from 1872. Nobody talks about 1872 contract act. Everyone talked about land acquisition act being very old. Other countries have introduced specific construction law. Is it time for us to consider a special law for effective dispute resolution and contract enforcement? That's what the legislature can do. And we have ideas. A lot of us are working on that. The second is the judicial ecosystem. You know, there is talk about this alternative dispute resolution mechanism. You go into arbitration, you go into conciliation. The Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1992, I think, has been completely neutered by Section 34 because every appeal goes to the High Court. And once you're in the High Court, then you're like Trishanku. Nobody knows when it will uh, get concluded. I know our company is, uh, has arbitration awards from 2012 where the authority went in appeal and not one hearing has happened in the last six years. So how can you have time-bound judicial uh, finality in deciding the matters in front of them and there our legal uh, colleagues are uh, uh, more uh, uh, expertise uh, than me. The third is the executive. In a lot of cases in dispute resolution, when there is a business to government issue and an award is given to business, the executive is very hesitant to give that money as payment of the award. And it's largely because of fear of the, the five C's and so on and so forth. Uh, CAG will catch me, CBI will catch me. And that's why they say that until you go to court and you get an order in your favor, I'm not going to pay you. But even more worryingly, how do you get business to business contracts going? Suppose you are a large company and you have subcontractors and there is an agreement between you and your subcontractor, are you really honoring that? And is the judicial ecosystem enabling that? There is a long way to go, but happy to talk longer. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this session. Uh, you know, we have seen, of course, India will become the third largest economy, but there are so many complex issues in so many sectors. And today we were very grateful to our panelists for giving us a vignette on three very important sectors that will address some of these issues. I want you to give a very big hand to the panelists. Thank you so much. And uh, it's been a very, three very innovative CEOs that will take innovative India forward. Thank you so much.